Welcome back to the Prepare Like a Pro live chat show. My name is Chad McLean. I'm your host on, on this episode. I'll update you on all the big things to happen for this upcoming week, such as announce this week's episodes on the Prepare Like a Pro podcast and YouTube channel, discuss our power tip that we do every week at the end of this episode to help footballers get fitter, faster, stronger, and strength and conditioning coaches to help footballers get fitter, faster, stronger. We're going to add in a new segment now that it's round one in the Australian football season, and that will be providing this week's football tips as well as a special prize. If you enter in your tips for the week before the round starts to our Instagram, email, LinkedIn, however you want to send them, and you get all tips right, so if it's nine rounds that are played, you're going to get a free strength and conditioning program valued at $99, and I'll also throw in a free consultation or private gym program uh, coaching session if for those living in Melbourne. Obviously, if you're living outside of Melbourne and that coaching session can't be face-to-face, then we'll do it on a Zoom consultation where we'll dive into your goals uh, and discuss not only your short-term goals, medium-term, long-term, and however I can help your athlete development to allow you to be the best footballer you can be for this up- upcoming season. So over $200 worth of uh, products there if you get nine out of nine tips. So have, let's have a bit of fun with it. Uh, remember to send in your tips before the round starts to enter. So this week, round one, get the Sharon footy out. We have uh, Melbourne versus Doggies. I tipped Melbourne, went to that game. Um, lucky enough to work with the Melbourne Football Club and, of course, tipped Melbourne. They had a great performance. Carlton Richmond, we had our VFL game on. I didn't watch that one, but I tipped the Tigers and got that one wrong. St Kilda Pies, a lot of my mates go for St Kilda and go for Collingwood Football Club. So I went to that game and tipped the Pies and they won. Geelong Essendon, my original team that I go for, the Bombers, uh, were pretty disappointing. They got smashed by the Cats. However, I did t- tip the Cats. I think they're going to have a strong start of the season. They seem to have a point to prove. GWS and Sydney Swans, uh, I tipped my cousin's team, Hayden McLean, to kick a couple of goals, which is always great to see. And the Swans got up. Lions versus Port Adelaide, I tipped Lions there, home game, and they had a strong finish to come out on top there. My old footy club, uh, Hawthorne Football Club and North Melbourne Hawks, uh, the young team had a great performance and, and beat North, so great start to the season to the boys. Well done. Adelaide versus Fremantle and Eagles versus Suns, those two games are actually going on right now. So I've tipped the uh, Fremantle Dockers to get an away win uh, against Adelaide and then West Coast to beat the Suns for a home game. So we'll see how that pans out. But so far, I'm tracking for Melbourne, Pies, Geelong, Swans, Lions, Hawthorne. So I've got six um, out of the potential seven. So we'll see how we round off. For round two, just so if you want to get involved and see how you stack up against my votes, we've got Doggies versus Carlton. I'm tipping Doggies uh, to bounce back and get back on the winning table for that one. We've got Swans versus Geelong. I think uh, Swans will get up as a home game for that one. So I've tipped uh, Sydney Swans. Sorry, no, tipped Geelong. Uh, As I mentioned earlier, I think they're going to have a strong start to the season, so I'm going away uh, for the Geelong Cats to get a win at Sydney. Uh, Collingwood versus Crows. I reckon Collingwood will continue their momentum for a strong start. Uh, Crows, obviously the youngest team in the league, uh, have it up against themselves this year, but as long as they show some promise, I'm sure uh, everyone will be happy. Uh, Essendon versus Lions, I'm tipping Bombers to bounce back, um, but I'm a bit hesitant, but I'm going to tip the Bombers on that one against the Lions. Port versus Hawks, I think the Ports will be too strong a home game. Suns versus Dees, uh, obviously Melbourne will, will get up on that one. And North Melbourne versus Eagles, uh, I think North will bounce back and get a win, uh, their home game. The Eagles are obviously a bit iffy pre-season, um, so it'll be interesting to see how that game pans out. Richmond versus GWS, I reckon Tigers will bounce back and beat GWS, but I reckon that'll be a tough one. Dockers versus Saints, Saints didn't look very good um, up live um, against Pies, so I'm going to tip the Dockers for that one, uh, especially home game, I reckon they'll get through. So like I mentioned, if you get, uh, you got nothing to lose, send through your tips, throw a direct message, email if you want, jack at preparelikeapro.com. 
Uh, for this year, we're going to do this every week. And like I mentioned, if you win, you get a free month on our online high performance program valued $99 and a coaching session with myself valued at $120. So over $200 worth of value there for free. All you need to do is send in your tips. We'll do one winner each week. And I'll announce that on this week's um, podcast. For our upcoming live show, we have Dale Griffith, which we did that live interview a couple weeks ago. He will, is the founder and CEO of Coda Nutrition. He's also an author and a firefighter. So really interesting chat around dehydration, the negative effects of it for footballers, um, what you should be doing to fueling your performance as well. Um, so if you're interested in upping your game, particularly now that we're in season, um, either you're playing practice matches or round one is around the corner. So all those um, things that you do away from the club, like staying hydrated and making sure you're well filled with your nutrition, um, but also like um, Dale talked about, um, it doesn't just stop there. You've got to maintain that as best as you can throughout the game to only um, prevent the negative effects of dehydration, but also to allow yourself to recover better going into the next week. So really informative chat, recommend listening into it. That will be released on our podcast on Tuesday. Wednesday, our Get Better plan will be on why body awareness is key to preventing overload type injuries. So if you've had a few soft tissue injuries or tendinopathies, uh, definitely tune in for our Wednesday's Get Better plan. Uh, not only do we help you develop your body awareness, but also how to detect pain and what the difference is between good and bad pain. Uh, Thursday, we have a live episode with Daniel Cherney, the sports journalist for Code. So really looking forward to him. We caught up with him for a coffee uh, a few months ago um, through mutual connections. And, uh, yeah, great fellow. And, and looking forward to having our first sports journalist um, sharing his journey. Uh, it's a competitive field like strength and conditioning or being a high-performance athlete. So no doubt we'll get some takeaways there. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to sharing his story um, and how he's got to where he's got to at the highest level for a sports journal. We have our episode bite-sized interview from the um, Australian Leading High Performance Facilities with Lachlan Wilmot, the co-founder of Athletes Authority, discussing the difference between private sector and elite sport. So that will be released on Friday. Make sure to tune in there and listen in to Lachlan's uh, presentation. Our power tip this week is going to be how coaches can make the most of warm-up. So stay to the end of the episode to listen to that one. I'm now going to tune into Instagram to answer this week's questions. G'day, Instagram world, and thank you for tuning in to Prepare Like a Pro Live Chat Sunday show where I answer all your questions for the week, whether you've sent them in via email, you tune in live to this segment and send in your questions, or you might have sent them in through any of our socials through direct message. So I'm going to get into the first question, which is from Caitlin. Is it better to do a f to football train after or before gym? Great question, Caitlin, and there's definitely some different philosophies in this, but typically for Australian rules footballers for the majority of the year, We'll do our lower body strength work, which is what I think that you're referring to, uh, after our work on the field, um, mainly because of priority. So we want to prioritise the football, the tactical, technical side of things over the physical side of things. Uh, so what we know with from a physical development point of view is the change of direction work and the high intensity efforts on the field far outweigh the demands on the body in the gym. So from a... Um, risk to benefit ratio from a, from a performance point of view. Perform, sorry, performance point of view, the tactical side of things. So making sure that we're cognitively fresh, as well as um, from a technical point of view. So our ability to execute skills, um, we want to do those things first, and then that way we can adjust the gym program for the individual, uh, depending on how hard they went in that field session, what the GPS is showing. If you don't have GPS, then um, simply um, having a chat with the athlete. And for the athletes listening in that don't have a strength and conditioning coach, you, by doing your field session first, you're adjusting the gym to suit suit the field. Um, so if that way you're using your, your tickets, uh, well, let's say your fresh tickets uh, on the field stuff, which is the most important. Then you do your conditioning and then we do our gym. 
It's not to say the strength and power work and the work that we do in the weights room isn't important. It's just it's just um, saying that the field stuff is more important, but also the field stuff has a higher risk if we do that under fatigue. So that's why typically you'll see most programs at AFL at least doing their field sessions first, and then they finish with their lower body strength. Um, but doesn't mean you can't do certain exercises like um, power work, uh, activation sessions, so like um, mini band work, um, plyometric work, med ball explosive work through the upper body and, and um, plyometric, so lower body jumps before the session um, to help prime you for the field session, but we wouldn't be doing typically your heavy deadlifts or heavy squats or things of that nature before football. So good question, Caitlin. Hopefully that helped. Harry, top five physical attributes for an inside midfielder. Great question, Harry. I would say uh, developing your aerobic capacity, uh, so your ability to be able to handle high volumes of running. You know, uh, Midfielders can typically cover anywhere between 10 and uh, up to 14 Ks of, of total distance. Um, but also you want to be able to be able to do repeat high intensity efforts. So um, being able to be recovered enough to be able to produce force quickly. So thinking like your first three steps, how well you can do that, not only in the first quarter, but also the fourth quarter. So that's where repeat speed sessions are really, really important. So aerobic capacity, repeat speed, change of direction ability. So making sure you're mobile through the hips and the ankle so you can uh, have fluid change of direction ability and also your technique is sound to change direction laterally. That would be the third. Um, some good body armor around the ribs because there's a lot of collision and a lot of contact in the stoppages, a lot of heavy um, contacts with your ground ball gets, hard ball gets. So making sure you've got good body armor around the trunks, that's where the gym program can be really helpful. That would be the fourth. And then fifth, I would say, your ability to fend off, so your core, trunk, and upper body strength, so that ability to fend off the old Dustin Martin fend off would be my fifth. One. But great question, Harry. Hopefully those top five physical attributes um, are helpful for you and, and interested to know your feedback too, mate. Let me know what you think uh, the top five are. Chloe has written in our next question, how often should you do speed and agility training for football? This will very much depend on where you are in season, off season, and pre season, uh, Chloe. Um, but typically, uh, in season, which is where most footballers are at the moment, VFLW, AFLW, and the AFL and BFL men's program are all in season. So we'll go with that. Um, so I would say for our speed work, we do speed exposure typically once a week, um, and that's in training. And then you'll get another hit in games. So um, typically you just get exposure to max velocities and a little bit of top up speed distance, sprint distance. If you didn't get a lot from the game prior, um, and then we keep that topped up just to keep up your chronic exposure, um, which is just your week four weekly average, um, intact, and then some high velocity exposure as well, just to keep the body, um, prime for this week's game. So we'll do that on your main training session. Um, because what we do know when we look at GPS data is typically footballs won't open up too much in football drills. So that's where the strength and conditioning works. So after a warm up or somewhere throughout the middle of the session, you just do some um, sprints, through, mainly only three efforts at high intensity. Um, so we get exposure to that during the week before the game. Uh, and then typically in a game, most footballs will get uh, between 90 and 95%. Uh, exposure as well so you get another hit there in the game so that's two hits in season agility you should be doing agility three times a week so every football session so your two training sessions and then on game day uh, so that's reactive change of direction work so basically football and then from a change of direction technique point of view i usually will do um, my linear acceleration work um, on the thursday and then alternate that with lateral change of work and work every fortnight. So linear acceleration and top speed work. And then the next um, Thursday, I'll do change of direction technique. So every fortnight, um, we do it from a technique point of view. Great question, Chloe. Hopefully that helped. And uh, let me know if you have any questions or queries. Sean has written in our last question. And if you're listening in live, feel free to send in any questions and I'll do my best to answer in your questions. We've got Sean for our last question is written, what are some of the best methods to preventing hamstring injuries? 
Um, what we know with hamstring injuries is as we age, you're at higher risk. You can't prevent aging, of course. Um, then the, the other likelihood of injury is having a history of hamstring injuries. So we want to try and prevent hamstring injuries as best we can. So I love the fact, Sean, that you're asking questions around how to prevent because you are at higher risk as you age and you're also at higher risk as once you've had a hamstring injury. So we want to try and prevent them as best we can. Um, eccentric strength training, the research is strong on this. That's why the Nordic hamstring exercise is very popular. If you don't know what that is, just search it. Uh, hamstring injury prevention playlist on our YouTube channel. We've got the Nordic exercise demonstration on there, both Nordic and weighted Nordics. Really good way to isolate the uh, eccentric portion of basically lengthening our hamstrings under load. Um, so we're lengthening is strengthening for our hamstrings. We want to make sure that we've got good range of motion through there and they can handle uh, high force on range as well. Uh, regular exposure to sprinting. So like we, I mentioned with Chloe's questions before, so making sure we're getting that regular exposure to sprinting. So at least every uh, week you're getting exposure to above 90% um, of max velocity and even above 95% you'll get different activation of the hamstring, uh, hamstrings I should say, at different velocities. So 90, 95% is really, really important. We're getting regular exposure to that. And uh, sound running technique as well, uh, it's really hard to prove the kinematics side of things is is a factor, but I generally personally believe if you're running efficiently and you're running well and you're loading the body as optimally as possible and you're focusing on that, then you're yeah, definitely doing yourself a service in terms of um, looking after your future self from a hamstring prevention point of view. So making sure you're doing some run drills, some run technique, and you're doing them with the intention to move more efficiently. Uh, every week when you're doing your warm-ups at a football club uh, is really, really important for preventing hamstring strains. Uh, and so that would be the big ones. Obviously, the fitter you are as well because under fatigue, you're cognitively not going to be moving uh, thinking as well. Uh, so you're more likely to put yourself in a vulnerable position or not move as well. Um, uh, so making sure you're, you're as fit as you can be uh, every season and you're covering well going into the next game or the next main session as well so you sleep your nutrition, hydration, uh, and your managing stress. So it's a there's a lot of factors that go into it, um, but they would be the big ones. Uh, so hopefully that helps, Sean. Um, in terms of our power tip for this week and why warm-ups are so important, I just want to tell a quick story. I recently had a conversation with one of our interns and then I wanted to ask our senior footballers, what are your top three focus areas for an in-season warm-up? And the intern uh, mentioned injury prevention, so learning things like landing technique, um, Running mechanics, so developing your acceleration, your sprinting and change direction mechanics, and then mobility. The football talked about stretch, having fun, and plenty of touches of the football. No one's wrong or right in this one. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can do in warm-up, but I thought that would be a good opportunity this week for me to just go into a bit more detail on why warm-ups are so important. So sorry those are listening into Instagram. I'm now going over back to YouTube now. Um, but you can feel free to hang around and listen in to the rest of the podcast. Um, so why warm-ups need to be intentional, engaging, and effective? And these are some of the key areas that I focus on and so almost some rules that I stick to when I'm planning my warm-ups. And that's the first one. I want to make sure warm-ups are intentional, they're planned, but also you're able to read the cues and understand the state of the group and what they need best to prepare themselves for the upcoming football session which is probably the most important thing. The warm-up needs to take into account what is the session for that day. Is it our main football session? Is it more our craft fundamental recovery session? So understanding what's ahead for the athlete so you can prepare the group for that. Um, we want to make sure that we're also having some fun uh, and that the athletes are enjoying themselves, they're engaged. So some tips and tricks around that is including games like touch rugby, uh, soccer, dodgeball, uh, these reactive competitive games that are different to football because football is a long competitive season and the preseason is long as well. We want to make sure we're not um, just doing the same stuff all the time, like more well, warping your, your old school couple laps around the oval and then some stationary kicks. We want to keep it interesting. We want to keep it fresh uh, and make sure that the, the players are engaged uh, and surprising them every so often can be a good thing. Involve the coaches. So from a tactical, technical point of view, there might be some drills that um, from the game that's played they want to add into that's going to help the performance of, the, of that session ahead. So that's where you can get the skills coach involved, particularly for kicking and craft work. Um, so you might do 
10s, 10 minutes with yourself, then back over the coach five minutes, and then they finish with you for some high intensity speed work or change of direction work. I found that works really well. So then the athletes are getting a, um, a different voice throughout the warm up. Uh, and so fun. Uh, make sure you, you've, you're planned and you're understanding where we're in with the week. Are we focusing on recovery? Are we focusing on intensity? And then the third one is, um, like I mentioned before, movement quality. So it's a great opportunity as a coach to actually improve their speed, their fitness, their strength by improving how well they move. Um, so change of direction, acceleration, sprinting mechanics, and jump and landing are the big rocks from a movement competency point of view. And um, there's no doubt that if in a warm-up you can have some intentional drills in there to improve the group and give the athletes feedback uh, if they're not moving as well uh, on how they can improve their movement competency. So uh, if you're getting two warm-up sessions, or there's any of you guys listening into the podcast, if you're getting two warm-up sessions, the coach is giving you 15 minutes, there's 30 minutes where you can make the athletes better. Um, so even in season, we can we can make some gains. Uh, so I think a perfect warm up takes into account all those demands, uh, the session ahead, the current state of the athlete in the group, while incorporating some athletic development technique work specific to to your group. Uh, enjoyment and and involving the coaches is uh, critical, and and will make um, for more enjoyable warm up. Prep for the session ahead, and um, from the athlete development point of view, remember jump and land, change of direction, acceleration, and max velocity exposure. Um, take into account where you are with your week as well. So if you just come off from a game, you know, that's where if you, if, if from a football match, the players might be a little some fatigued, no doubt, on the Tuesday uh, for the first session. So that's where we want to make sure that if you are doing some games, they're not going to open up too much. So with your touch rugby, touch uh, and soccer and dodgeball, make sure the dimensions of the game uh, are small so they're not going to get huge exposure to um, sprinting. Um, so making sure you're thinking about it as well. You're not just you know, playing like cat and mouse and you expose them to high intensity and they're not warmed up enough or they're fatigued going into that. And you do a hamstring. Um, there's nothing worse. Um, so make sure that you are incorporating these factors in with your uh, warm-up uh, to ensure that you're, you're getting what you want out of it with while lowering the risk. Okay, so going into uh, our... Final bit of the podcast, um, we've got our update from a program point of view. So our rack pulls are moving into a power shrug. So the athletes were focusing on a bit more power now that we're in season uh, and taking down our strength volumes. Uh, we're going to go from two lower body strength sessions down to a one lower body strength early in the week and then a total body strength for our second lower body search session. So that way it brings our lower body volumes down, but we want to keep the intensity high. So we're still focusing on improving our strength and our power because ultimately we want to be our strongest, as strong as we possibly can, and most powerful come finals. So intensity is key. How heavy you're lifting that bar is really, really important. But we're going to take out the grinding. You're not trying to um, grind through those extra reps and maxing out um, minimal fatigue, high intensity is where we're at. Um, for those interested in joining the program, we do have a free 14-day trial. All you need to do is just go to our website and you can sign up. Uh, it also allows you to sign up to our email list where we send out things like um, blog posts, uh, upcoming events, and uh, every now and then I'll invite you to our weekly or monthly Zoom presentation as our Get Better plan that our uh, athletes are on. So just head over to preparelikeapro.com for that. This week's review was from Lachlan H5. He wrote, great, great podcast, chats to the stars of the game, really good to get insight in the AFL life. Thanks, Locke. Really appreciate the review, mate. And if there's any way we can help you out, like you've helped us out with a review, make sure to hit us up. And if you're a fan of the podcast and you've been listening to a while, um, make sure to do the same as Locke and, and rate us on Spotify, which is a new thing that you can do now, as well as write a review on iTunes or Google. That would go a long way in not only helping um, uh, myself in, in um, preparing for the podcast and what you're liking. Uh, obviously, Locke's, Locke likes the AFL players we've had on the podcast, so getting more athletes uh, on the podcast um, will be a key area that I take from that feedback. But also it helps us reach more fans like yourself or, or an audience similar to yourself, footballers or strength and conditioning coaches. So um, really appreciate the, the time and the effort 
into that and, and thank you lock for, for sending it in that's it for this week's episode guys thank you for all the questions that sent through uh, if you have any questions or queries those listening to the recording or if you're listening in live remember to send them in via direct message you can send in a voice message as well on our podcast page on our website and um, make a appearance on the podcast or you can just simply email us at jack at preparelikeapro.com and i'll answer those questions the following sunday thanks guys see you on the next episode